It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. The U.S.-North Korea peace talks that began in Singapore appear to be in jeopardy. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was due to visit North Korea this week. But President Trump canceled the trip after receiving a letter from Pompeo's North Korean counterpart, Kim Jong-chul. The letter reportedly expressed frustration at the U.S. for refusing to send a peace treaty formally ending the Korean War. The establishment of a, quote, lasting and stable peace regime was one of the steps outlined in the four-point pledge signed by Trump and Kim Jong-un in Singapore. Joining me is Tim Shorrock, correspondent for The Nation, whose blog Dispatch Korea is available at timshorrock.com. Welcome, Tim. Uh, Let me start with uh, a story in The Washington Post that revealed the existence of this letter uh, from Pompeo's North Korean counterpart, which prompted Trump to cancel Pompeo's trip. And it's written by Josh Rogan, uh, and he writes about the letter this. He says, the exact contents of the message are unclear, but it was sufficiently belligerent that Trump and Pompeo decided to call off Pompeo's journey, unquote. Now, after that, uh, reports emerged in in CNN and elsewhere what the letter actually contained, and it was, as I said, uh, this frustration on North Korea's part that the U.S. was not willing to take steps to end, uh, formally end the Korean War and establish a permanent uh, peace treaty. So my question to you is, going back to Rogan's characterization, is that demand by North Korea belligerent? No, no, it's not belligerent at all. And and in fact, this letter appears to be a a restatement of the North Korean negotiating position, you know, which has been from the top that they want to stay, they will progress toward denuclearization in a step-by-step process and one of the first things they want is a peace agreement. Uh, and they want, you know, as as they make steps, the U.S. to make steps toward uh, dropping some of the sa- sanctions, loosening some of the sanctions on them, and proceed into a peace regime, into a peace process that really works. And, and then where North Korea will feel at the end of it that they're, you know, that the U.S. as an enemy is no longer an enemy. And that they can feel they can they can safely disarm and at least disarm their nuclear uh, force. Uh, and you know, if you recall, and this is important to remember. Like you know, what was agreed to in Singapore was no, there was just some broad steps agreed to. And the first two steps, and I'm in, excuse me while I read this a little bit. The first two points of the Singapore agreement, or the the, the Singapore understanding, was that the U.S. and the DPRK will commit to establish new U.S. DPRK relations in accordance with the desires of their people. That's number one. Number two was the U.S. and the DPRK will join efforts to build a lasting and stable peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. And to, of course, North Korea and South Korea, that means, you know, a peace agreement ending the war. And so, you know, those are the first two. So I think North Korea from the beginning assumed that the U.S. would begin moving on those uh, two steps immediately. And in fact, you know, the two sides made some progress in doing that, some symbolic steps, perhaps, you know, dropping these, stopping the military exercises in North Korea, uh, you know, blowing up uh, one of the testing sites and, and releasing uh, uh, the remains of U- U.S. 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 dead in Korea in the Korean War. So some steps have been taken. But when Pompeo went to Pyongyang in, in June for his first real negotiation on, the, on this whole agreement, uh, you know, they, the U.S. side insisted, you know, denuclearization has to take place first before any steps toward a peace process. And I think, you know, as you recall, that was also that meeting did not go well. And there were some angry exchanges after that, although the North Korean side kept saying they, they appreciate Trump's efforts to resolve the issue. You know, so I think from the very beginning, North Korea has seen this peace process ending the war as, as critical uh, to ending what it sees as the hostile policy by the United States, which is its main demand in terms of, you know, how it will denuclearize. So, you know, I don't think it's any, any more belligerent than any statement that Trump or Pompeo has sent them restating the U.S. position. It's just how this was characterized to Josh Rogan, who, by the way, is not on the reporting staff. staff. He's, on an, he's an op-ed reporter. He's an opinion writer. But apparently his opinions carry great weight in Washington probably why uh, he was leaked this story. Um, but absolutely. So in, in terms of that July meeting that you mentioned, um, let me ask you quickly. Uh, the criticism of the North Korean side that we hear often in the U.S. media is that they've been disrespectful so far. They've been um, um, 
uh, tough to negotiate with. And so when Pompeo goes to North Korea in July, the critique was that Kim Jong-un refused to meet him. And that was seen as a sign of disrespect and a lack of seriousness on the North Korean side. Uh, why do you think Kim Jong-un declined to meet with Pompeo then? Uh, well, I, I, I think, you know, I don't know who expected him to meet every time, but these are negotiations. And so I think, you know, once the, the, the leaders of the two countries, i.e. Trump and Kim Jong-un, you know, made this broad statement of, of purpose of what they're going to move toward, then it was left to, uh, you know, both their intelligence services and then the diplomats to, to pick up the ball and start the actual negotiation. So I don't think it was any kind of insult for Kim Jong-un not to go. I mean, Trump didn't go. I mean, there's not, these are not presidential or leadership level talks or high level talks, you know, involving, you know, the Secretary of State of the United States and, and his equivalent in, in the DPR case. So right. okay. I don't think that in itself is, you know, anything. I think what was important were the disagreements that were openly expressed at that meeting. Right. And those were? Well, basically, you know, that, that the U.S. was insisting on denuclearization before anything can happen, before a peace process can happen, before any kind of sanctions are lifted, before any movement is made on the U.S. side toward meeting the North Korean, you know, demands and requests as part of this. I mean, they say you have to denuclearize. The, the, the big issue that people, a lot of observers were expecting in when, when he went there in, in July was... Uh, when Pompeo went there in July, was that the North Koreans would have some, you know, big declaration of all their nuclear sites and where their weapons are and that kind of thing. Uh, and there's even been talk that there's been discussions of North Korea possibly sending its actual weapons to France or or the UK or some other country as a, you know, as sort of a medium step effort uh, move toward you know total denuclearization. But none of that happened, uh, I think. And and part of the reason is that you know the U.S. wants you know, you know what they consider this like you know concrete, irreversible steps for denuclearization before anything, and so like even like inter interim steps seem to be unacceptable to the U.S. until there's this like full accounting of their nuclear weapons, and we're all the way through into like this process of of you know new North Korea disarming. And the thing is, like, you know, North Korea is not Iraq after 2003. It's an independent, sovereign country. It wasn't invaded. The U.S. doesn't have any right to go anywhere. You know, these things have to be negotiated. Right. And, and actually, and, and because of Iraq, and because of Iraq, North Korea is probably all the more defensive, knowing what could happen to a country that can't defend itself. Exactly. Iraq, Libya, other countries, you know, the, you know that's, that's part of the issue for, for, for them. But the, 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 the other significant thing about this difference is that South Korea, Moon Jae-in's government, has also kind of embraced a step-by-step -step process where they always say, you know, yes, our ultimate aim is denuclearization, but they also want a peace agreement. I mean, Moon Jae-in was actually hoping to fly to Singapore at the last day uh, to kind of have this three-way declaration of the end of the war. And then there was talk more recently of Kim Jong-un going to the September UN General Assembly and that three leaders could meet there and make a similar kind of declaration. So I think that this cancel, you know, Trump's cancel, cancellation of Pompeo's trip pretty much put the kibosh on anything happening at the UN General Assembly. And the US side, including many of the, uh, you know, the national security officials that are working for Trump, as well as, you know, the think tanks and all the, all the organizations that are, you know, helping to frame U.S. policy do not want to have a peace agreement. They, they don't, you know, at this time, they want to wait until North Korea has given up all their weapons before they can, they can, you know, move toward that. And that's a difference they also have with South Korea. And so, you know, that's why in the last few days and weeks, we've seen a lot of, you know, analysts and North Korea so-called experts, you know, saying, expressing their disappointment in South Korea as, South Korea is moving too fast for the United States and its rapprochement with North Korea. Right. Okay. So the issues here in terms of the pessimism amongst the U.S. officials about the prospects for a peace deal and their frustration uh, with South Korea, that South Korea is moving independently, um, was really brought to light in a really interesting piece that recently came out by Daniel Snyder, who is a uh, specialist at Stanford University. And 
He writes, uh, after speaking, he says, to senior officials in Washington, including some who are directly taking part in the North Korean negotiations, that there is a broad consensus amongst Trump's team. And I want to read you a quick excerpt of what that consensus is. Um, first, uh, the foundation of, the, of this consensus is a profoundly skeptical view of the possibility of achieving final, fully verified denuclearization of North Korea, the goal that has been reiterated by the new special envoy. While there are some differences concerning exactly what might be achieved in the talks with Pyongyang, not a single official dealing with North Korea said he believes this ultimate aim is reachable. The only possible exception is the president himself. That's the first pillar of consensus. The second pillar of consensus, Snyder continues, is a deep concern that the South Korean government of Moon Jae-in, which has driven the opening to North Korea, is no longer bound by the need to move in tight coordination with Washington. Some even fear the alliance itself may be in jeopardy, unquote. And Snyder goes on to write, and again, this is based on speaking to people who are directly involved in the talks and in, in the Trump administration, that Washington is prepared to sanction South Korea if need be, if it, if it, if it goes too far away from Washington's line. Uh, Tim Shorrock, your reaction to that? Well, it's astonishing that U.S. policy has not changed in IOTA since 1945, since it accepted the surrender of Japan and Southern Korea. I mean, ever since then, you know, the U.S. has been trying to shape, uh, you know, shape Korea th the way it wants, it wants Korea to be shaped. And the U.S. has always seen moves by independence as, you know, a, a prob problematic from the point of U.S. national security. Uh, and, you know, this is, just, this is, you know, historical kind of aberration in American policy. I mean, it's the way we treat South Korea is as almost a colony, and this has not changed. I mean, it, it's just an, an incredible to read people like that saying, you know, just assuming that South Korea does not have the sovereign right to try to unify and re re reconcile within its own country. I mean, that's, you know, Korea is one nation. It's a divided nation. It was divided against their will. The whole point of the peace talks with Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in and the Pan Moon-jun declaration they made in April is to end this war and end this division. And they're trying to seek ways, you know, what they've been asking the U.S. is to lift some sanctions so they can, for example, open the liaison office that they pledged to do in Kaesong, which is just north of the DMZ in, within North Korea. And they want to have this, you know, north-south office to begin the proceedings, you know, in the, in the economic and cultural and, and security, uh, you know, path they're laid out for themselves. They want to have an office where that can be organized and managed and, you know, communication between north and south. But the U.S. has told them that that office, building that, you know, uh, new buildings there and that kind of thing would violate sanctions. And so, you know, you have this, like rift between the United States' officials and the think tanks and all the supporters of this hardline policy saying, you know, South Korea cannot go its own way. And that's what I find just amazing, that that, that, that policy really hasn't changed in 70 years of being in Korea. We'll leave it there. Tim Shorrock, correspondent for The Nation. His blog, Korea, Dispatch Korea, is available at timshorrock.com. Tim, thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.